الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Before I begin my lecture did you mention the title? Yes, I did. What was it? Dua. Okay, dua was yesterday. My bad. I was told that it was supposed to be X and Y. According to the information I had, I didn't read the brochure. I uh, acted upon the information that I got. So yesterday's scheduled that was sent to me, that was dhikr and dua. So we've done this. And you can imagine my surprise when I came last night to prepare for today's lecture and I find that it says dhikr and dua. That would be very interesting to repeat myself again. So you can watch the video of yesterday, inshallah, and you have now a full hour free to do whatever you want. But then the organizer said, no, we will give you another topic. And it's totally new for me. So today's topic is about repentance and seeking forgiveness. Before I go into my topic, I only heard the last bit of your story about the boy speaking from the grave to Umar. With all due respect to historians or narrations that come to us from whether it's Al Hafiz ibn Kathir or Al Zahabi or not Abu Osama, definitely, um, or any of these great scholars, we have principles, we have foundations. So anything that goes against the Quran and the Sunnah, we simply do not accept it. Because if I accept that this boy speaks from his grave to answer Umar, I might as well ac uh, accept that the Prophet, وسلم, when I go to his grave, he will also speak to me. And I know people, yani not in their full sane capacity, that claim and swear that they went to the grave of the Prophet والسلام, and his hand came out of the grave and they give bay'ah. They shook hands with him. And I keep telling them, Akhitab, why didn't you pull him out? Seriously, to solve our problems. We have a big problem in this world. He's the best one to solve them. He could not answer back. So such stories, we have to be careful. It's nice. It is jaw-dropping sometimes. It makes you feel good. But Islam is not about emotions. Islam is about Quran, authentic sunnah, with the understanding of our righteous predecessors, the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, the tabi'een and the tabi'it tabi'een, and Allah knows best. So our topic for today is about repentance and seeking forgiveness. And without a doubt, if you want to reach Jannah, you cannot do so without repenting to Allah and seeking his forgiveness. And Allah Azza wa Jal answers you if you make dua. Does he not? Imagine who can be worse than Iblis, than Satan. He says, Oh Allah, postpone me to the day of judgment. Making dua. Allah says, You're granted. So if Allah answers Shaytan, Iblis, what about your dua? So why do we go through repentance and asking Allah for forgiveness on and on and on again? First of all, because these are part of Allah's beautiful names and attributes. Allah is known to be a tawwab. This is one of his names. And he, one of his names as well is Ghafir. Ghafur, Ghaffar. Now, these three names all stem from the same source. 
And that is ra fa ra. And in Arabic, this gives the idea, the notion of protection. You know the warriors, the soldiers, they wear a helmet. In Arabic, is named, is called al mirfar. Why is it called mirfar? Because it protects your head from the blows. So when you seek Allah's forgiveness, when you make istighfar, this means that you're seeking Allah's forgiveness, you're actually asking Allah Azza wa Jal for two things. To conceal your sins and not expose you. And to protect you from the consequences of the sin. Do you think that when you sin, there won't be any consequences? You will be let to do whatever you want. Nothing comes free without a price. You fall into sin, there are consequences. Maybe in this dunya. Maybe Allah delays it to the day of judgment. And this is why a lot of us, we sin and we wait. Where is the following blow is going to come from? And we don't see anything. So I said, huh, okay. It was overlooked and we sin again. And we sin for the third time until, with, until our lives would be full of sins. And we would feel safe from being punished. This is when the punishment comes. When you're least expected. And unfortunately, in the past, the scholars, the righteous people, when they used to sin, they used to know exactly what they had done. The Imam says, I make a sin and I immediately see the effect of my sin on my ride. Horse or a camel, it becomes stubborn, it doesn't drive well. And on my spouse's behavior. My wife is a sweetheart. But because I've sinned a few hours ago, when I come home, she's nagging, she's fighting, she's not polite with me. So he says, I know where I got this from because of my sin. Nowadays, no one of us can do this because we are indulged in an ocean of sins. So the car breaks. Well, I don't know, was it this or that or number 10 or number 100 or number 1000 sins. The children are sick. I lose my job. I'm in debt. My health is not as it used to be. All of these are due to our sins. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, highlighting the beauty of istighfar, seeking Allah's forgiveness. He says, if Allah's servants were not to sin, Allah azza wa jal would create other creation of His who would sin and then seek Allah's forgiveness and Allah azza wa jal would forgive them as He is most forgiving, most merciful. This beautiful hadith shows us that Allah the Almighty love that we sin, correct? Allah loves that we sin. I'll read the hadith again. The people are asleep. Maybe they had a good breakfast. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, if you, slaves of Allah, were not to sin, Allah will take you away and create other people who would sin, then seek Allah's forgiveness and Allah will forgive them. From this hadith, do we learn that Allah loves to be sinned? No. This is impossible. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, and Allah has made hateful to you disbelief, defiance, and disobedience. This is something that Allah hates and made it hateful to you. So what is the meaning of the hadith? The meaning of the hadith is that Allah is most forgiving. 
And hence, he loves it when people ask him for forgiveness. Not that he loves them when they sin. No, this is something that is not possible or is not applicable. Yet, Allah created us sinful. As the Prophet said, والسلام, all sons of Adam are sinful. And the best of these sinful are those who repent. So having this in mind, we should know that Allah Azza wa Jal is so great, so magnificent, that He Himself who created us and does not need us. Does Allah need me to pray? I need to pray. Does Allah need me to pay zakat? I am the one in need to pay charity and zakat and to do good deeds. Yet, Allah the Almighty, with all His might, with all His power, He is making Himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala, lovable to us. He is being kind to us so that we love Him, not the opposite, not the other way around. Allah says in the Qudsi Hadith, O oh my servants, you sin day in and day out. You sin in the day and you sin in the night and I forgive all sins. So seek my forgiveness and I will forgive you. Imagine Allah Azza wa Jal is addressing you with this. He knows that you sin, but he's telling you, I forgive sins, come to me. And I'll forgive your sins. Allah Azza wa Jal opens his hands to those who sin in the night so that they, he would forgive them in the morning. He opens his hand in the morning for those who sinned at night. Allah Azza wa Jal addressed those who worship idols, those who killed his loved ones, those who've sinned gravely, Allah addresses them with what? With hellfire? With punishment? Subhanallah. Allah says to them, Say, O oh my servants, who have transgressed against themselves by sinning, do not despair of the mercy of Allah. Indeed, Allah forgives all sins. Indeed, it is he who is the forgiving, the merciful. This is one of the most beautiful ayahs in the Quran. Scholars say that it was revealed when Wahshi ibn Harb. Do you know the name? Wahshi ibn Harb. He is the one who killed Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. And after he did this, he felt remorseful. He felt sad. His heart was filled with depression. He thought of coming into Islam, but he thought to himself, how can I be forgiven? I killed one of the best men in my time. And I've worshipped idols and I've done heinous sins. How can Allah forgive me? Look at my sins and yours compared to these sins. They're nothing. And therefore Allah the most merciful revealed this beautiful ayah. Seeking forgiveness, by the way, is part of dhikr, which we talked about yesterday. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, O people, repent to Allah and seek his forgiveness, for I seek Allah's forgiveness and I repent to him per day. A hundred times. And he also says, Tuba, glad tidings. And some scholars say, Tuba is a tree in Jannah where the rider travels for 500 years in its shade. How big that is. And this tree is for those who, the Prophet says, it is for those who will find in their record books a lot of seeking forgiveness. When you all the time say Astaghfirullah, 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 then this would be for you. Does seeking Allah's forgiveness have benefits in this dunya? 
When I seek Allah's forgiveness, does it have benefits? It does have a lot of benefits. And some of these benefits are combined in an ayah mentioned in Surah Nuh. Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُ رَبَّكُمْ Nuh is addressing his people. And he says, and, I, and he said, ask forgiveness of your Lord. So asking forgiveness is istighfar. What are the benefits out of it? He says, indeed, he is ever a perpetual forgiver. He will send rain from the sky upon you in continuing showers. So number one, you complain of droughts, you have problem with rainfall, keep on seeking Allah's forgiveness and see what happens. Then he says, and give you, when you ask Allah for forgiveness, increase in wealth and children. So you have debts, you have financial problems, the whole day, all what you think and say is Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. And Allah Azza wa Jal would pay off your debts, would improve your financial situation. You complain that you don't have offsprings, you don't have children. Then ask Allah Azza wa Jal for forgiveness and you will have children. Of course, providing you're married. And then provide for you gardens and provide for you rivers. All of these are benefits of what? Of seeking Allah's forgiveness. Allah is telling us the fruit, but who would listen? So one would say, what is the easiest way to seek Allah's forgiveness? The answer is, Astaghfirullah. If you say Astaghfirullah, have you fulfilled it? Yes, you've sought Allah's forgiveness. Are there better ways? Of course. Sayyidul Istighfar, the master of seeking Allah's forgiveness. This beautiful dua must be in your dua list in the morning and in the evening. We have a long list of dua that time did not permit us yesterday to mention. See, in my computer, I have an antivirus program. Anything, anytime I get attacked, it says, don't worry, you're protected. Likewise, as Muslims, I walk, I feel the evil eye due to my charm and my beauty. And they're laughing. Jazakumallah khair. I feel black magic. You know, you're going with the sorcerers and the witches and I fear jinn possession. Every time I look at my wife, I fear envy. So what do I do? I live in constant fear. Most Muslims live in constant fear because they're not protected. Wallahi, if you say the adhkar of the morning after Fajr and in the evening, whether after Asr or Maghrib, it's an issue of dispute among scholars. Wallahi, you walk with your head tall. I'm not afraid of anyone. Sheikh. He will put a spell on you like hell he would. Wallahi, he can't because I'm protected. Allah is protecting me. So we have a problem with adhkar. This dhikr takes you straight to Jannah. Insha'Allah, takes me and you straight to Jannah. Listen, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, the best prayer for forgiveness is to say, I'll read it in English. You all know it in Arabic. Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha ant khalaqtani wa na'abduk wa na'ala ahdika wa a'adika masata'i So the translation says, Oh Allah, you are my Lord and I'm your slave. So in dua, this is the best etiquette. You praise Allah Azza wa Jal by complimenting Him and exposing your poverty and humility to Him. You're, <coughs> you're my Lord and I'm your slave. You have created me. And I am faithful to my covenant and my promise to you as much as I'm able. I seek refuge with you from the evil of that which I have done. I acknowledge before you all the blessings you have bestowed upon me. And I confess to you my sin. Forgive me 
For there is no one who forgives sins except you. The Prophet says, والسلام, Whoever says this during the day, believing in it with certainty, and dies that day before evening comes, will be one of the people of paradise. The path to Jannah. Say this dua. And he says, والسلام, And whoever says it at night, believing in it with certainty and dies before morning comes, will be one of the people of Jannah, narrated by Imam al-Bukhari in the Sahih. Also, imagine, who's number one in our Ummah after the Prophet والسلام, Abu Bakr. So imagine when Abu Bakr comes to you and says, Teach me something to ask Allah in my dua, in my prayer. What would the Prophet usually say? Abu Bakr helped me with his money. So ask Allah for money, for wealth, because this helps Islam. He bought Bilal and he set him free. So money in the hands of Abu Bakr is beneficial. Because money, most of the times, when it's in the wrong hands, it would make us arrogant. It would make us wrongdoers and sinful because we have much a lot of it so with Abu Bakr it's a different story no he did not tell him this maybe he told him to have a big house maybe he told him to have children no nothing the Prophet said say Abu Bakr in your prayer oh Allah I have wronged myself greatly and no one forgives sins but you so grant me forgiveness from you and have mercy on me for you are the oft forgiving most merciful. This hadith is said to whom? Dua. Abu Bakr. The Prophet is asking Abu Bakr to seek Allah's forgiveness and to repent. What does Abu Bakr have of the sins we have? What does he do? He's the one who used to hold his tongue and says, Oh Allah, this is what has taken me to the wrong places and would throw me to hell. He is fearful of what he says and speaks. And this dua was given to him by the Prophet ﷺ to recite in his prayer. Do we recite this in our prayer? Do we say it with certainty? This is seeking Allah's forgiveness. But what is the difference between seeking Allah's forgiveness and repenting? There's a big and huge difference. Seeking Allah's forgiveness is done mainly by the tongue. Sometimes the heart is accompanying it, and this makes it the best way of seeking forgiveness. And sometimes you're just rewarded by saying it, and this is very, very minimal, to the extent that some scholars, like Sheikh Al-Albani, he said that when you make dhikr or istighfar, without contemplating upon it with your heart, this is not accepted. Because it's like singing a song. You're not paying any attention to it. You just, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. And you change the channel, akhi. Let's see the next video clip. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. So definitely, you're not seeking Allah's forgiveness. You're just saying something without contemplation. Now, tawbah is far, far greater than seeking Allah's forgiveness. Allah Azza wa Jal says, and it is He, subhanahu wa ta'ala, who accepts repentance from His servants and pardons misdeeds and He knows what you do. Allah Azza wa Jal's beautiful name, at tawwab In an Arabic, this is an exaggeration, meaning that He's constantly repenting over and upon His servants. It's not once He repents and that's it over you no he keeps on doing it day and night and a true believer when he falls into sin his heart is affected by it it's filled with remorse he feels the burn inside his chest fearing Allah Azza wa Jal fearing falling into the consequences of his actions or being thrown into hell. 
once he feels that the whole world is so small that it cannot hide him from Allah Azza wa Jal, when he believes that there is no escape from Allah except to him, when you see a lion, when you see the fire, when you see an enemy, you run from them. But when you fear Allah, you run to him. You never escape Allah Azza wa Jal. Once Allah knows that you are sincere in your fear and in your repentance, only then Allah would repent upon you and accept you. Allah says, but indeed, I am a perpetual forgiver of whoever repents and believes and does righteousness and then continues in guidance. Allah will keep on forgiving and repenting. Now, why would anyone repent? People repent when they know Allah Azza wa Jal. So, there are many reasons and benefits coming out of repenting. First of all, we repent in obedience to Allah's order. Allah ordered us not to sin. We fell weak and we sinned. What to do next? Allah orders us to repent to him. So if we do, Allah forgives us. If we don't, then this is the consequence that we have to bear. Allah says, O oh, you who have believed, repent to Allah with sincere repentance. Perhaps your Lord will remove from you your misdeeds and admit you into gardens beneath which rivers flow. And when perhaps comes in the Quran, this is not for being doubtful. The Asa, as the people of Tafsir say, Asa Allah, meaning that Allah will do this. But when we talk to one another, perhaps I will come tomorrow, this is probable. When Allah says perhaps this is certain and it's going to happen. When you repent, this is a cause of success for you in this life and in the hereafter. Because the heart does not find its tranquility. It does not find its ease. And it would not feel that it is alive without repenting to Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah the Almighty says, and turn to Allah in repentance. All of you, O believers, that you might succeed. If you repent, you may succeed and you will succeed in this life and in the hereafter. The issue is, and this is extremely important for you to identify, because all of this talk will have no benefit until you recognize and identify the core of the problem. What is the core of the problem? The core of the problem is that you and I do not feel that we are sinning. So when someone tells me, Akhi, repent to Allah and ask him for forgiveness, I would say, inshallah, deep down I would say, what of? I don't have sins. But I have to be modest and say, yes, astaghfirullah wa atubu la ilaha ilaha illallah subhanahu. We fail big time to identify our shortcomings because we don't accept others to advise us. If someone comes to me and says, Shaykh, I have an advice. Akhi, fear Allah. You've done this and this and this. I keep on giving justifications and excuses. And no, you got it wrong. No, you did not see me do this. No, you have to check your eyeglasses. Maybe you have to see a doctor. When we fail to accept people's advice and we fail to look in the mirror to identify our own shortcomings, we never seek Allah's forgiveness and we never repent. A true believer before he goes to bed contemplates, why did I say that word? It's backbiting. It's going to haunt me in my grave. Then it's going to haunt me in hellfire. Why did I abuse that poor person? Why did I shout at my wife? Why did I mistreat my children? I didn't hug them. I didn't kiss them. 
My neighbor invited me. I didn't answer his invitation to a wedding or to aqiqa. Why and why and why? And I'm about to sleep. And wallahi, I know so many people, my own relatives, who went to sleep and never woke up. And they were healthy, as strong as an ox, as they say. When you die, when you sleep, this is minor death, it's called. When you sleep, you don't know. And this is why part of the dua. بسمك اللهم أضع جنبي وبسمك اللهم أرفعه In your name, O oh Allah, I put my head side to sleep and in your name I wake up. O oh Allah, if you take my soul, then have mercy on it. And if you return it so that I wake up in the morning, then preserve it as you preserve the souls of your righteous servants. This is our dua, part of your protection, part of your antivirus, but anti-shaitan, anti-evil eye, anti you have to keep on memorizing these before you go from your home, before you ride in your car, while you're in your car, before you eat, after you eat, when you enter the toilet, when you come out, when you sit in the morning, in the evening, everything is governed and controlled by these beautiful adhkar. Who doesn't want Allah to love him? I once asked this question and a very innocent brother said, I don't want Allah to love me. So, A'udhu Billah. Why are you saying this? He said, because if Allah loves me, he's going to test me. And if he tests me, I'm going to fail and go to hell. So, so Akhi, think of what you say before you say it. You're going to hell both ways. The way you're saying it, you're going to hell for no, no, no way any out of it. No one can say, I don't want Allah to love me. You say, oh Allah, love me, but make it easy on me. Oh Allah, grant me the afiyah, this beautiful dua. So I'm mixing between yesterday's lecture and today's lecture. The dua that you say in the morning and the evening. So many people come, how can I protect my children from the evil eye, from the jinn? How can I protect my wealth? I have a farm, I have a company. There's a dua. The Prophet says, alayhi salam in Arabic, you look into it in Hasan uh, al-Muslim. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-'afiyata fi dunya wal akhirah Allahumma inni as'aluka al-'afwa wa al-'afiyah fi dini wa dunyai wa ahli wa mali. And the rest of the dua you can find. These four things I ask you for forgiveness and protection in my religion, in my world. In my family and in my wealth. If you do this in the morning and the evening, you're protected. But who does and who says this and who says it with contemplation, with concentration? So every one of us need and want Allah to love him. Correct? If you seek Allah's forgiveness and repent, Allah will love you. Allah says in the Quran, indeed, Allah loves those who are constantly repentant and loves those who purify themselves. Constantly repentant. Allah loves you. So you repent from throwing a soda can out of the window. This is a sin. You're harming people. This means that all drivers in Nairobi should repent to Allah greatly because the way they drive Mashallah, I thought Saudis were bad drivers. Not after seeing, Mashallah, the way you guys drive. Repentance is one of the great means of entering Jannah. Allah Azza wa Jal says, except those who repent, believe, do righteousness, for those will enter paradise and will not be wronged at all. You repent, you go to paradise. This is a free ticket if you believe and this beautiful verse at the end of Surah Al-Furqan imagine who can be worse than someone who takes idols and worship them other than Allah and they kill innocent people and they fornicate and commit illegitimate sexual act who can be worse than these people Allah Azza wa Jal says, And those who do not invoke with Allah another deity, or kill, 
the soul which Allah has forbidden to be killed except by right. And do not fornicate or commit unlawful sexual intercourse. And whoever should do that will meet a penalty. Multiplied for him in the, is the punishment on the day of resurrection. And he will abide therein humiliated except. Shuf subhanallah. Listen. Except for those who repent, believe, and do righteous work, for them Allah will replace their evil deeds with good deeds. How is that possible? Scholars say, this has two meanings, replacing bad deeds with good deeds. One meaning is that those who associate others with Allah, this is called what? Shirk. Allah would replace it with Tawheed. He will become a believer. Those who kill people and terrorize them, Allah Azza wa Jal would turn this bad deed into being safe and secure to all Muslims. Those who fornicate and make illegitimate sexual relationships, Allah will make them have halal spouses and they will marry. This is one interpretation. The other interpretation is that Allah would turn the bad deeds into good deeds. So you have one million bad deeds because of your shirk. And 300,000 sins because of your killing. And 100,000 sins because of your fornication. Allah would turn all of this into one million four hundred thousand good deeds, good hasanat. And this is from Allah. And this is also in an authentic hadith where the Prophet tells us والسلام, that Allah on the days of judgment, when he is holding his servant to account, he would place a barrier, a visor between his servant and the rest of humanity. And he will show and expose to him his bad uh, sins and deeds. The small ones. And he said, did you do this on Thursday? Did you do this on Friday? Did you do this on this and that? And he shows him his sins and the servant thinks, Khalas, I'm doomed. I'm going to hell. These are all the small sins. And yes, I, can, I have to admit, confess, I have no other way and no other option. Then Allah says, with my grace, I concealed it in this life, in dunya. Nobody knows about it. And you were not bragging about it. I used to listen to music on my own. Allah concealed me. Someone else used to go in his car, lower the windows and blast the music. He is bragging about sins. So Allah says, I've concealed these sins in this dunya and I conceal them in this life and turn them into good deeds. The servant of Allah becomes greedy. He says, oh Allah, there are major sins I don't see. The list you showed me were all small sins. I have major sins. That I do not see. And Allah laughs. And when we have a Lord that laughs, well, wallahi, we will not be sorry on the day of judgment. When Allah the Almighty laughs, and laughter is part of Allah's beautiful attributes that we believe in it as we believe in all other attributes. Nothing is similar to our attributes. Allah Azza wa is nothing similar to anything else. So we believe that he laughs. We believe that he loves. We believe that he's satisfied. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Unlike his creation. Now. Repentance has conditions. It, de it doesn't just come like istighfar. You say astaghfirullah. And that is it. You cannot just say, Oh Allah, I repent to you. End of story. No. There are conditions. And the beautiful thing about these conditions that they deal with the past, with the present, and with the future. So there are five conditions for repentance. And some scholars make them six. The first condition is Sincerity. You have to repent sincerely to Allah Azza wa Jal. What do you mean, Shaykh? 
I mean that if I were to be a thief and I have my toolkit with all different keys and I'm going to this brother's house to break in and steal his wealth and I'm determined to do this. Once I reach the, ho the, the house, I park my car, I walk with my toolbox in the middle of the night and as I'm attempting to enter, I see a police car. So I say, Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayh. And I'm repenting to Allah, I'm going back home. This repentance is for Allah? No. This is for the fear of being caught. Allah will not accept your repentance because it is not sincerely for him. Likewise, a person who smokes and gets cancer and he stops smoking. He said, MashaAllah, you stopped smoking. May Allah forgive you. He said, no, I didn't stop smoking for forgiveness. I stopped smoking for the doctor. He said, you're going to die. So this guy's repentance is accepted, though he quit. But he does, it is not for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal. The second condition is that you have to feel remorse. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu wasalam, an-nadamu tawbah. Which translates to remorse is repentance. Meaning that the majority of repentance is focused on being remorseful. Like when he says, Al Hajju, what? Arafa. The Prophet says, Al Hajj, Arafa. Does this, does this mean if I only go to Arafa and then go back to Jeddah, I have completed my Hajj? No. There has to be tawaf al ifada, there has to be ihram, there has to be so many things part of the pillars. But the Prophet is telling us that the most important of all is Arafah. The most important thing in repentance is remorseful. Remorse is something of the past. I sinned in the past and now I'm remorseful. Allah will forgive me. The third condition is present time. Remorse in the past. Presently, you have to quit on immediate effect. Meaning that if I'm smoking and I cough and I say, Wallah, ya akhi, smoking is bad. I have to quit. I will repent. Okay, what are you doing? He said, I still have the packet. I have to finish it. So hopefully by t tomorrow, maybe uh, it will finish. I will. Re no, this is not acceptable. You have to... Repent on immediate effect. You have to quit the sin immediately. The fourth condition is something to do with the future. Remorse is the past. Quitting is the present. And in the future, you must intend not to do it. What does that mean? So many people fall into sin when they travel. And this is why we always try to advise people do not travel unless you have to and when you travel travel with good company and when you travel travel to a muslim country a lot of the muslims now take the holidays in june july august when it's summer holiday and they go to kafir countries what do they do there they visit the masjids islamic centers and they make a lot of ibadah you know and i know they don't do this if they go to Dubai, if they go to uh, Paris or London, they're going to fall into sin. So you have to intend when you repent not to do it again. Our friends come from holiday and they've spent a whole month in these bad countries, sinning, fornicating, drinking, partying, uh, being wasted. They come, they make Umrah and they say, oh Allah, forgive me. Khalas, alhamdulillah, yes, we have sinned a lot. May Allah forgive me. And then they call their travel agent. Akhi, the hotel you put us in is awful. Listen, next August, you put us in a better location and we will pay you more. Is this repentance accepted? He's intending to do it next year. So then Allah will not accept your forgiveness, accept your repentance and will not forgive you because there is no remorse. You're not remorseful. Okay, you quit it now, but you're planning to do it next year. And likewise with all other sins. And the fifth condition 
is that your repentance must be at an accepted time. Because there are two times Allah will not accept your repentance. Privately, individually, and generally. Individually is when you're on your dying bed. So when you're dying and your soul is coming out, you're in defiance or in, you're in denial. No, no, I'm not going to die now. I'm young. I'm 85. What are you talking about? I still have like 15, 16 more years. You meet people, they are over 100. Sheikh, how are you? Oh, alhamdulillah, living, living. So death is approaching. He said, no, no. Nuh lived for 950 years. I still have 850 to go. People still wish and hope that they're going to live forever. Even on their dying bed, they're not believing until the soul begins to come out. Then they say, Astaghfirullah, okay, I repent now. It's too late. Individually, Allah will not accept your repentance when death comes to your collarbone, when your spirit is coming out, when your soul is coming out. Generally speaking, when the sun rises from the west, khalas. This is for all humanity. Allah will not accept anyone to repent. Because this is a global phenomenon. The sun is rising from the west. It just went there and it's coming back again from the same location. This is the time where Allah does not accept repentance. And finally, the sixth condition is when the sin is between me and you. There are sins between you and Allah. You drink, you smoke, you watch haram. This is between you and Allah Azza wa Jal. But there are sins between me and you. If you steal my money, if you backbite me, if you physically harm me or attack me, your repentance by saying, Oh Allah, forgive me. I stole a hundred million shillings from the brothers and the sisters and so on. But uh, khalas, I seek forgiveness and Allah will forgive me. This is not enough. You have to return the money back to the people. Because the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, O people, in this dunya, if you have wronged someone, try to make it even before the day of judgment. Why? Because on the day of judgment, there are no dirham or dinar. There are no currencies. It's only good deeds and bad deeds. And he will take his money. He will take his right. So if you have transgressed, wronged someone, you have to clear your account with him. Seriously, does Allah accept repentance? Some people are hopeless. They are hopeless. They are in despair. <clears throat> they think, I have so many sins. And other people say, no, you should give me like 15 minutes uh, reminder before. You cannot tell me that the time is uh, over. So this is, uh, this is for the training session. Next conference, inshallah, you give 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes. So I will assume it's 15 minutes. Okay. I'll try to make it short. We have so many sins. I have a lot of brothers, come, I have a lot of sisters coming to me. Akhi, I'm not in a church. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. It doesn't work this way. You have Allah Azza wa Jal. You address him. But they come to the Shaykh, to the Mawlana. Shaykh, I have sinned, I have done. Ya khi, you are not allowed to tell me your sins. Maybe in, 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 in uh, the confession box, the other guy has a paper. Yes, what did you do? Where did you go to? Hmm, was it good? In Islam, it's not like this. If I come to you and say, Akhi, yesterday I had a smoke. Allah will not forgive me. Do you imagine that? If I tell you, last week I took someone's money. Allah will not forgive me. Because Allah Azza wa Jal has concealed me, concealed my shortcomings, and now I am making it public. So Allah will not forgive me. And there's a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari exactly saying, stating this. Whenever you sin, do not tell a soul, not even your mother, not even your father. And the worst of people are those who tell their spouses. 
I get brothers coming to me with messages. Sheikh, I got married and I was so happy with my wife for 15 years. Then I told her that I had an extra marital relationship before we got married. And all hell broke loose. How can I rectify it? You cannot. Khalas, it's gone. You expose yourself. You're crazy. Why do you tell? Sisters coming to me and say, Sheikh, I'm feeling remorseful. I had an affair and now my husband is asking me and pressurizing me. Can I tell him that I knew 25 people before him? I hung up. This is crazy. What is in the past is in the past. Allah Azza wa Jal concealed it. Allah Azza wa Jal will forgive you. The moment you open your mouth and say, yeah, 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 I did this and this and this, good man. No, you're not. Allah will not forgive this particular sin because you've exposed yourself. So does Allah Azza wa Jal truly forgive us? Yeah, Akhi, Allah's name is the most forgiving. Allah is the one who repents upon his servants. Imagine someone killing a hundred souls in cold blood. He goes to a scholar, I've killed a hundred souls. Do you think Allah will forgive me? Before he killed the hundred, he killed 99. So after killing 99, he felt remorseful. He went to a monk, one who worships Allah 24-7, but doesn't have knowledge. He said, monk, I've killed 99 people. Do you think Allah will forgive me? The monk said, forgive you? You're in hell. You're crazy. So the, say, the man said, hmm, 99, two figures. If I kill him, he becomes three figures. That's good for my record. So he kills a hundred people. After a while, he feels remorse. It's burning in his heart, no matter how hard or bad the person is. He goes to a scholar. Oh, scholar, I killed a hundred people. Do you think Allah will forgive me? He said, of course. Allah forgives everyone. Seek Allah's forgiveness, Allah will forgive you. Allah in the Quran told us in Surah Al-Buruj, do you know Surah Al-Buruj? The trenches, when the king ordered them to dig trenches and fill it with fire, and then he threw the whole people of the community in it, burning them because they would not associate others with Allah. Allah tells us in the Quran, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَتَنُوا الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَتُوبُوا Those who have tortured the believers, uh, women and men, through burning them alive, and they did not repent, Allah would throw them in hell and would torture them with fire. So Allah is opening the door even for those to what? To repent. Those who made a son to Allah, the Christians, Allah told us in the Quran about the Christians who made Allah one out of three and they made Jesus his son. Allah is addressing them and calling them. Won't they repent to Allah and seek his forgiveness? Though they made a son to him. By this, Allah is opening the door for them. And I will conclude my 15 minutes to make it into nine. This is a discount for the brother uh, by mentioning two, two stories of the companions. Do you know Ma'iz ibn Malik? Do you know Ma'iz? Ma'iz is unknown to us, except through this incident. He's a companion. He comes to the Prophet in the Masjid, he said, O Prophet of Allah, purify me, for I have sinned. The Prophet says, what did you do? He said, I committed adultery. This is a serious offense. If someone comes to me and says this, I'm going to take my Glock and shoot him. You sinful person, you don't fear Allah. No, the Prophet ﷺ turned his face. The man stood up and came from the other side and said, O Prophet of Allah, purify me, for I have committed adultery. The Prophet ﷺ looks to the right. He doesn't even speak to him four times. Then, the Prophet ﷺ asked the audience, is he crazy? Before executing, he asks and ensures that there are no obstacles. Is he crazy? They said, no. Is he intoxicated? 
Go and smell his mouth. So one comes and no wine, no beer, nothing. So the prophet asks him, maybe you have touched her. He said, no. Maybe you've kissed her. He said, no. Maybe you've hugged her. He said, no. The prophet asks him a straightforward question. Did you commit intercourse? He said, yes. So the prophet, alayhi salatu was salam, orders them to stone him to death. And this is the penalty for a married man or woman who commits, who commits the acts of adultery. So whether he's married, divorced, widowed, it's the same ruling. So they stone him until he dies. And some of the companions are talking ill about him. Look how he exposed himself until he was stoned like a dog. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, don't say that. Seek Allah's forgiveness for your brother Ma'iz ibn Malik because he has repented a repentance. If it were to be distributed and divided by a whole nation, it would cover them all. What kind of repentance was in Ma'iz's heart due to this heinous crime, adultery? Not only that, another woman comes to the Prophet ﷺ. The following day, she's a Ghamidiyya. She's from the Azd. And she comes to the Prophet ﷺ in public and says, O oh, Prophet of Allah, purify me. So the Prophet looks to the other side and ignores her. She said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, do you want to treat me like you had treated Ma'iz by ignoring him? By Allah, I am pregnant. There's nothing that can be concealed. What does the Prophet say, alayhi salatu wasalam? The Prophet says, go, and once you give birth, come. So the woman leaves. For how long? Seven months? Eight months? Nine if she knew that today she got pregnant. Usually, she takes a month or two. And she comes back with a child in her hand. She says, O oh, Prophet of Allah, purify me. The Prophet says, go until you breastfeed him and the child can eat. So she leaves for another year or so, breastfeeding him. And she comes with the boy holding a piece of bread in his hand, meaning that he can eat now. And she insists, O oh, Prophet of Allah, purify me. Almost two years or more. She could have traveled to China on foot if she wanted to escape Allah's punishment. And no one would look for her. The Prophet didn't imprison her. The Prophet told her, go. If she had second thoughts, no one would look for her. But it is the fire ignited in her heart with repentance. From the fear of Allah Azza wa Jal. From what she had committed, fearing the consequences of this crime. So she comes to the Prophet of Allah and says, O oh, Prophet of Allah, purify me. So the Prophet ﷺ orders them to uh, dig a hole in the ground and they place her in it and they stone her until she dies. One of the companions cursed her. While stoning her, some of the blood came to his body as according to the narrations of the gushing of the, of, of the blood. So he cursed her. And the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, do not curse her. For by Allah, she had repented a repentance. If it were to be distributed among 70 households of Medina, it, was, it would have covered them. And Allah would have forgiven him. Did you find anything better than she gave up herself in exchange for repentance. Therefore, brothers and sisters, the issue of repentance and of seeking Allah's forgiveness is a very vast topic. Today, when you read the Quran, every page you read it, read it twice. And look for the number of times Allah is calling you to repent and to seek for his forgiveness. And then you will discover and find out that we have wronged ourselves
by not seeking Allah's forgiveness and by not repenting to Allah. May Allah the Almighty have his immense forgiveness over us all. May Allah Azza wa Jal erase all our sins. May Allah Azza wa Jal turn all our bad deeds into good deeds and repent upon us. Hada wallahu a'lam wa nisbatu al-ilmi ilayhi aslam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.